Good evening and welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. We appreciate you taking your time to be here. Tonight's panel of experts will explore the need and justifications for public ownership of public infrastructure. My name is Julie Olson. I'll be your moderator this evening. I'm a business person from the Pacific Northwest. I've, I'm the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats, and I am on the advisory board for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. We have a great lineup of speakers this evening. I think you'll find them very interesting. And in order to give everyone an opportunity to speak, we're going to um, dispense with introductions and go right down the list. I do wanna let everyone know that we will have opportunity for Q&A at the end. So if a good question comes to mind, please write it down. And uh, at the end of the speakers, raise your hand and we'll be happy to call on you and get those questions answered. So with that, I wanna go right to the top of our list and go to Alfeka Mutardi. She's a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund and is now the chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Alfeka, take it away. Great, thank you very much and welcome to all of you. It's great to have you on our evening's discussion this evening. Um, I would like to uh, sort of uh, set out uh, a little bit of an introduction for the other speakers uh, by first talking about the economy and then talking about how the National Infrastructure Bank proposal can help uh, to, um, to take care of problems in the economy and also build out our infrastructure without, um, while keeping our public infrastructure public, and uh, then quickly uh, give you a rundown on where we are with the bill. So with that, uh, let's start with the economy, where we are. Uh, it looks like we're now, uh, since uh, we spoke uh, the last a month ago, we're really uh, seriously heading for an economic recession. We've had a slowdown in economic growth in the first quarter of this year, um, much uh, slower than it was uh, in the previous quarter, even though uh, inflation is uh, trending down a little bit. Uh, we've had uh, leading indicators now pointing that the economy is sharply pointing in a downward direction. Everything from manufacturing, housing starts, bank credit, all that is slowing. And there is an indicator here, which I've pictured, called the Conference Board Leading Economic Index, which is uh, pointing absolutely in the wrong direction. Uh, what this index is, is a composition of 10 indicators that tend to lead recessions, those recessions are shown in these gray areas on this chart, and uh, the uh, indicators uh, lead the recession by about 10.6 months uh, from the peak down to where the recession started uh, in all of these little different instances. And where we are right now is 15 months past our peak for uh, 2020. Uh, one. So we're way overdue for a recession. That's a very big reason for concern. And the other big reason for concern is Fed policy continues to crush everything. Uh, the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve wants to push down on demand, push down on the banking sector, um, raise interest rates uh, so that people won't, won't buy so much and that'll su supposedly help prices to come down, although it's not a sure thing. Uh, but uh, the, uh, if they can continue to do that, um, they, they could wind up pushing up unemployment uh, say by as much doubling as much as doubling it by the end of the year. So um, and that's not going to help our supply problems either that are causing pricier goods uh, and energy costs and those kind of things. Um, today we have a big uh, push up in price of services and childcare and those other kind of things. The uh, the uh, infrastructure bank can help with all of that. So the economy is headed for a recession. In addition to that. We have a problem with another financial crisis in the works. Uh, we've seen that with long-term warning signs. Uh, the Fed kept uh, interest rates too low for a 10-year period. Uh, that made people go out and rush to borrow money at these really low rates uh, to keep their sort of zombie companies afloat. Uh, so the banks are now loaded with a whole lot of bad debt. In addition to that, I'm sure you've all been following the news. We've had several banks that have gone into uh, receivership. Um, there's been a, a runs on the banks. Depositors are pulling their money out 
uh, because it's only earning like maybe half a percent. It's uh, it, the deposit is too big to be insured by the FDIC insurance uh, system. So what they're doing is putting it into money markets, and all that was engineered by the Fed policy to raise its Federal Reserve. Uh, rate to uh, up upwards uh, close to 5%. If you're only getting half a percent on your deposits in a bank, you're going to want to get much better returns on your investments. So you'll pull them out. And uh, this has led to $2 trillion leaving deposits in banks and going into money markets. And no bank can withstand those kinds of with withdrawals. Most banks keep a reserve of 10% of your deposit money in case people come and ask for their money back. No bank can withstand a, a, a run of 40% withdrawal depositors' monies. And that's now happened with the a third bank, the First Republic Bank, uh, had a 40% uh, withdrawal of deposits and will likely go bust as a result of this uh, uh, bad Fed policy. So the, the Fed policy is not tamping down on inflation, but it is breaking the banking system. And stubbornly high inflation will force banks to keep on using this tool that they think works so well, it doesn't work really too well, uh, to keep the pressure on, which will keep on cooling the economy and could uh, hurt the very weakest businesses. They won't be able to pay back their loans to banks. If those banks uh, fall, uh, collapse and they owe money to other banks, this cause, cause a contagion or a domino effect, which could affect the whole um, financial system and make a, a downward spiral, or a spiral of everything. So what does the National Infrastructure Bank do in this case? Uh, first of all, our National Infrastructure Bank that we have proposed in Congress would create a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. So it's really big because that's our infrastructure need, and it is big enough to actually move the needle on the economy. And what happens is it's going to be building great, it's going to be investing in great infrastructure, the kind that we need for efficient transportation, clean water, connectivity. Uh, it'll keep this infrastructure in public ownership to keep the costs for providing these utilities down to a bare minimum. It'll increase economic growth. And the way that it leans against a recession is the same way that the previous bank leaned against a recession. It'll hire up anybody that becomes unemployed into these family great sustaining jobs, put them up to work, uh, building our nation's infrastructure. All of that will a cascade out into secondary business for everyone. All the manufactured inputs into the construction must be made in America. And all of that will really boost our economy and economic productivity and outlook. So that's how the bank helps and will work. Where the legislation is, um, our last bill um, uh, finished up with the uh, two, this 117th session of the Congress, which ended in December. Uh, it, that bill has uh, been tweaked and is ready to be reintroduced. We're excitingly waiting for that to happen. We're actively with our grassroots campaign going around and having legislators help us to contact members of Congress to see if we can get as many legislators to come on board as co-sponsors as possible, maybe even uh, a Senate bill. We're working on that as well. Um, and uh, we're very hopeful that the legislation will come out soon with the new bill number. Uh, and then at that time, we'll switch over to the new bill number, uh, whatever, whichever one it gets. This kind of a bank has been done four times successfully before. Some of our speakers are going to talk about that. This bank acts like a public bank. It uses uh, the same capitalization me method that Alexander Hamilton invented for the first bank of the United States by uh, asking holders of treasuries if they would like to invest in the bank. And then it goes on to give out loans exactly like a commercial bank. If you would like more information on how the bank works, you can look on our website, nibcoalition.com, to see a little bit more details of how it bank works. And then it will give out project loans in the critical areas that America needs, things that America needs, uh, rebuilding our transportation systems, our water systems, upgrading our power grid so that we can hook it up to renewables, building high-speed rail to make, uh, to, and much more rail in the transportation mix to get you know cars off the road and traffic congestion. Each one of you is paying thousands of dollars. If you live in a congested city like Los Angeles or Washington, D.C. or Chicago, you're paying thousands of dollars a year 
uh, to, in uh, extra fuel costs and wasted time sitting in traffic on the road. And this, this bank can help with all of that and get, get our transportation system unsnarled, build affordable housing. We have millions of Americans who are becoming evicted, who can't afford to pay for um, their everyday expenses, uh, housing, food. They're leaving Wa uh, Los Angeles and New York City because they can't afford to live there. And this is even causing worker shortage so all the, the bank will help with all of those things. And then finally, it'll work on the drought situation where we grow America's food. And we've got great ideas for how to do that as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Alfeca, for that great presentation. Uh, we are very fortunate to have our next speaker here this evening. He is the executive director of In the Public Interest and the co-author of Privatizing Everything. I'd like to welcome Don Cohen. Um, to our call. Don, you're on there. stage. Uh, okay. Do uh, you want to leave that up or you want to put me up? Or... <laughs> that yeah. might be easier. Um, so, uh, and just FYI, I'm the executive director of a group called In the Public Interest. I'll, um, I will put the organization website in the chat. And if you want to, you know, we because we cover privatization of all sorts of things. Actually, I can't do that. I can't chat to everybody. Um, and we cover privatization of schools and roads and bridges and prisons and everything. So, and you know, the book which uh, Julie put up on this uh, on the screen kind of covers a lot of those things, but it raises it up into a larger picture about you know private private influence and private control over the stuff that matters to us all, including, of course, infrastructure. So, I'm I was asked to talk about public-private partnerships, and I'm sure many of you have heard that phrase before. I'm going to be pretty elemental. I, I I wish I wasn't following Alfeca because you know I feel dumb actually. <laughs> um, so, but I'm gonna. So you've all I, I have people who you can raise your hand and you know have you heard of the term public private partnership? Is it something? Let me. I'm gonna P tell you that. PPPs. P or PPPs. Yeah, there we go. Or I, I usually say P3. So if I if, if, if you hear me say P3, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm going to start with a story that some of you may know, especially if you've heard me talk before, um, of what happened in Chicago in the year 2008. Uh, and this is an, it's an illustrative story. So 2008, if you remember, was the last, well, I don't know if it was the last, it was a great recession. It was a big one. Uh, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't uh, look at the chart carefully enough if I could, to know if I, you know, my, my dates. Um, and, but it was a time when cities were in deep trouble, bleeding red ink, you know, at the local, at the state level, but also at the local level. So what happened in Chicago on a Friday, uh, the, the, there was a proposal announced by the mayor, Mayor Daly, that a consortium of private uh, interests uh, would, uh, and, uh, and that would, and I'll tell you who they are in a sec, offered the city $1.1 billion up front in cash to solve their problems in exchange for control of the city's 36,000 parking meters for 75 years. Okay, the proposers were a consortium of Morgan Stanley, uh, what's referred to as a sovereign wealth fund from the Middle East, to a national investment firm, and, a, and then a national parking company, LAZ Parking, some of you may be familiar with. So announced on Friday, vote on Tuesday. So here's what happened. So it's, and they voted yes, of course. And, you know, desperate governments. So the, so there was, you know, virtually no scrutiny, no analysis. It was just jam it through. There's $1.1 billion. Somebody's dangling in front of a city that may have been in a situation where they'd had to lay off police and fire, fire, you know, fires and all that. Who knows? It was a terrible time, you know, and all a bunch of bad choices, I'm sure. So, but after the fact, they it was the Inspector General of Chicago analyzed it, other organizations analyzed it, and two things became true, became clear. They were always true. Uh, one was, even if it was the, you know, the only solution, uh, you know, the best solution out of a million really horrible solutions, and they, you know, to, you know, they decided to borrow money on their future parking meter revenues, they got taken. They sold a billion dollars too cheap. Now, it's a dumb thing. You shouldn't, not, you know, let me just be clear. This is till night, till 2083. We don't know if we're going to be driving then. Uh, I'm sure not. Um, so, but that's actually not the most important thing, right? It's a stupid thing to borrow. We all borrow on the future, right? That's what borrowing is, right? You'd pay it back later. 
but for 75 years is insane. But here's the bigger problem is that if the city for the remain, you know, through for the life of the contract until now till 2083, whatever that is, 60 years, if they want to eliminate parking spots, either temporarily for a street fair, but more importantly, permanently for dedicated bus lanes or bike lanes or pedestrian malls, because they want to change land use patterns or deal with housing or any number or climate. If they want to eliminate spots, they have to buy them back. In a kind of a complex formula, but essentially the future value of the spot of the spots. So what that means to me is that these deals, this de that deal was a straitjacket on democracy, that if the city council of Chicago wanted to do its job, which includes land use and housing and environment and transportation and all those things, it had it is beholden to this private interest, but you know, by virtue of a, a pretty lock solid contract for, for that long. So it's really that's for me, privatization at its core is an assault on democracy. So that's kind of the big picture. That is a terrible deal. Every mayor knows about it. Every city knows about it. It's a horrible deal. But the features of it are quite common. You know, the, you know these make whole clauses and they're called true up clauses or non compete clauses. So, so that when so that now that's a what a, a brownfield P three right. It already exists, but you know, a greenfield P three would be doing that for a new thing, a new road, or a new water system, or what have you. So I want to start with a couple of facts, I, and I'm not paying attention to time. So whoever's timing me, give me the three minute or four minute. Um, I want to start with two facts <laughs> that are so obviously and simple that it will sound stupid. The first thing is that things cost money. Um. It's it's kind of amazing that I, I've had to say that to reporters for the last four or five years. First thing, you got to start with the fact that things cost money. Um, the, 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 the second fact is that there's only one place to get the money from us through taxes, tolls, and fees. That's it. There are no other choices <laughs> um, fundamentally. So when the private sector says no, but you don't, because here's what the private sector says: we, you know, you know that that advocate for P3s says, well, the, the government doesn't have the money, so we and we have the money. It's sitting on the sidelines, so let us do it. So it's you know they're basically saying it's free money, you don't have to pay. They'll often say no new taxes and all that stuff, but you just have to be giving it back. The easy part is borrowing the money. It turns out you have to pay it back, right? And there's only one source of that: us. That's just, uh, you know, it's, it's simple, but it's so important to keep that in mind. So I want to go through the five, I want to get into a little bit of weeds. P3s, there's different kinds of P3s. There's five stages of construction when you're putting together a deal. There's design, there's build, there's finance, there's operate and maintain, referred to as DBFOM. But you could have, so that's a, you know, but you could have a design, build, and then the rest is all public. Or you could have a design, build, O, and M, but the financing is public. So there's all sorts of permutations of those DBFOMs that there. The big, the, the full privatization, the full pre P3 is all the above. They say, let us design and build it, we'll finance it, and then we'll make our money back through the operations and maintenance, right, essentially. That, that's a little simplistic, but it's fundamentally what they say. Give it to us for 75 years, give it to us for 40 years so that we can capture the revenue that comes, either the, ta the taxes, tolls, or fees. That's it. So that's all that we're talking about. So they, the, the arguments that we hear are threefold. Cheap, well, cheaper, better, faster, more innovative, you know, not quite like. Um, first off, cheaper, no. Private cap, you know, I'll take a good time. Private capital is just more expensive. You know, I mean, yeah, when I had these talks a year ago, I used to say you could build a house on 3%. You can't do that anymore. You could do it a little bit more, but but private interests want eight, nine, they don't very few want eight, nine, ten. I've seen performance for much higher. It just costs more, right? They then they say, well, we're more innovative, right? I don't know what that means, right? If there's somebody who's got an idea to do something better, more efficiently or better, when we, great, we could buy it from them, but we don't have to give them control of it for 20, for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so those are the, and then faster. We say, we can just, you know, we can get them, we can get this in the ground quick. And that, there may actually be some truth in that in, in certain situations. Um, so the, here's the big problems and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with here. I have four. 
often these deals, uh, you know, are based, they're all based on projections. They're not based on even forecasts. They're just thinking ahead of what might happen in the future. Um, and, you know, and we don't know. I'm being really simple here because I could get deeper into the weeds. But they, so um, that's number one. And often they, you know, these rosy projections happen. We'll do this and it'll work out for us. Well, there've been lots of road deals that have gone bankrupt because those projections, projections were too rosy. And when a road goes bankrupt, right? When a private company doesn't make it, it's not like they're a Starbucks and they just close the store. It's our road, right? So, you know, you can't ship, you can't take that away. We need the road. So we end up, you know, they, it comes back to us. The second issue is they say they're going to save money. There's very few places to save money. They can save money on lower wages of, of workers who ma maintain and operate the system, and they do. They could, um, you know, reduce the maintenance of the road, which has happened. It kind of depends. They're looking for ways to spend less money. I mean, that's what you have to look at. When they say more efficient or set money savings, which they do, you have to say, just tell us exactly where you're going to save that money. The third, of course, is as we these often will, sh you know, it's it's helping along the shift to towards commodity pricing, towards tolls, right, or or tolls on a road, or fees on for you know for for water use or what have you, you know, we're moving. The more we move towards that, the more we make that in those things inaccessible for people of low, low income folks, and we have to, we have to pay for the we have to do these things differently, and then finally we lose a whole lot of transparency once something goes private. All of a sudden, things become uh, private information. I'll give one last example of that. There was a, and then I'll stop, uh, a road in Texas, State Route 130 was built as a private deal, privatization deal, which was a number of years ago. Um, and it, it, the, they projected traffic. The tra it was between Austin and San Antonio. They projected traffic. It didn't happen. The first thing they did, because the traffic wasn't good enough to, to generate the revenue, is they raised the speed limit to 85 miles an hour. It's a truck route. Just seemed like a dumb idea, but that's the first thing. That didn't work. It went bankrupt. Some reporters, some investigative reporters uh, tried to get the traffic projections that the road was built upon, you know, that the, the, that was the, the factors that led them to say, there's a road here that could be built and be profitable and just be useful. And the, uh, they were told that those traffic projections were a trade secret, that they were private. And the courts back them up. So that's clearly a you know this road, whether it's needed or not, you have to make a decision whether a road is needed. The traffic, the projections of future use are clearly key information that you would need, and that ought to be public. That's just one example. So all these things happen when something goes from public to private. I think I've talked too long, so I'm gonna just hold it right there. Thank you. Rick. Thank you. Thank you, John. Really appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll have questions for you in the Q&A. So looking forward to be able to get some more details from you. Um, next, we are going to, going to go to, right to another one of our uh, esteemed speakers tonight. And um, that would be Professor or former professor of economics and statistics, Andrew Winnick. Um, he was a professor at Cal State LA and Cal State Santa Barbara. Andrew, you're on. All righty, let's do it. Um, I want to talk about inflation and the dangers of it, what causes it, and how that might or affect the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, let, let's begin by making it clear, as we've said, that we're going to be converting $500 billion in bonds into $5 trillion worth of real spendable money. And you better believe that we're going to be attacked for, well, you create that kind of money, you're going to cause inflation. You know, we're doing this, obviously, to build schools and bridges and all the rest of it, but that leave that aside. However, every dollar that we spend will probably generate something between three and seven dollars of economic growth. Everybody has to be, they're going to have to build the steel because it's going to be made in America. We have to hire the workers. Gener this will generate a great deal of economic income. But will it cause inflation? I want to take a minute or two to basically look at the current inflation situation and ask why it's happening. Because there are just a lot of distortion and, quite frankly, lies about why it is happening. Some claim that the main reason for the inflation is the programs that Trump and Biden pushed through during COVID to basically make up for all the 
jobs that were lost, businesses that were being closed, all the economic support that people got, and that that created a great deal of extra demand, and that caused inflation. That's simply a lie. Family income did not go up. It actually went down. It was not enough to even compensate for all the damage that was done by COVID. The idea that the government money that was spent in support of people and families and, the, and small businesses during, the, during, uh, during COVID caused inflation is simply not true. It's false. The second reason has some merit, and that is that there were problems on the supply side, that there were supply disruptions, variety of sorts. Uh, Trump had pushed, pushed through a tariff system on Canadian lumber. Uh, Bi Biden put through some limitations on exports coming in from China. That had some impact. The Chinese went crazy and doing this zero COVID business. Their production dropped. There were critical shortages of various materials, such as microprocessors for cars and things. And that caused disruptions. And of course, it was Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, the economic impact of that is very exaggerated, and a lot of it's not really true in terms of oil and what have you, but we can talk about that some other time. And that basically those disruptions ca cause economic dislocations that cause the inflation. There is some truth in that, but the consensus among economists is that maybe 30 to 60 percent of inflation was caused by the economic disruptions. So that leaves us with the other 40 to 70% of inflation, that was not. So what caused it? If it wasn't dem over demand or under supply, what caused it? The answer in word is price gorging. Basically, as Robert Reichs put it, they raised prices because they could. Corporate profits went up, Corp the corporations did very well, they raised their prices, they gorged it from, from, from us, and that is, that is at least 40%, and some argue more than half of the major cause of inflation. Now, the question is, what does this tell you is likely to happen with, the, with, with an infrastructure bank? There's no reason why it has to cause inflation, but it could. Two, two processes that, with this infrastructure thing that could be problematic. One, it's going to require extensive economic planning. You're, we're, we're talking about building, tr buying trillions of dollars worth of cement, steel, labor costs, what have you, to build bridges, schools, highways, whatever. If that isn't very carefully planned, so there aren't supply, supply interruptions, if there, so there aren't supply, you know, supply dislocations, that could indeed cause inflation. So one of the questions is, are we prepared to bite the bullet and talk about the sort of national economic planning to make sure that the, the supply of what it will take to build all these bridges will be done in a timely and effective manner? That's a serious issue. And quite frankly, we, I, to my knowledge, we've not totally adequately addressed that. Alpaca can talk about that. But the second one is, how do we avoid the price gorging? How do we ab 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 apply, ab avoid what's going on? We've done it before, we know how to do it. During World War II, we imposed price controls. If What we could do here is say to the companies that are involved with this thing, if you're gonna raise prices, let us know and tell us why. If you can demonstrate that your costs are in a sustained and substantial way are going up and you need to raise prices, Okay, we can accommodate it. We'll have to deal with that. We'll have to deal with some of these projects that are going to end up costing more than more than they than we thought they would. They might that could trigger some inflation. But if you cannot demonstrate that, then basically screw you. You can't raise prices. You will legally not allow you to. If we do some price control sy systems here, then then I think the, that plus the growth that the NIB could generate would basically prevent any inflationary impact. So I think we do, there's no reason that we have to be defensive about this, but I think we cannot pretend that when we talk to the American people and more than that, when we talk to politicians and especially when we talk to Republican politicians, if we're gonna tell them that over the next year, we're gonna spend $5 trillion that wouldn't otherwise have been spent. And it's gonna be in new money in the sense that we're gonna be converting bonds into dollars to spend, we better have a way of addressing the problem and explaining why that is not going to cause inflation. 
And simply talking about, well, there's going to be some economic growth. I don't think it's going to hack. We're going to have to deal with these other issues as well. And I'll stop with that. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate those comments. And I'm sure we'll have some questions for you in the upcoming uh, Q&A session. And uh, so our next expert uh, I'd like to go with is Ellen Brown. She is the founder and chair of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles. We have Ellen Brown. Thanks, Julie. So we're up against another um, debt ceiling crisis as we've had before. We've been here before. This chart on the left, I'm afraid, is not very visible because I had to capture it off a podcast. It would have cost me $146 to subscribe, so I just did my best. But anyway, what it shows, these are credit default swaps on U.S. debt. Uh, so it's basically insurance against the debt defaulting, and um, the price on the default swaps is, is substantially more than it's been in well over a decade. So concern is that we really actually could default, <laughs> hopefully not. But anyway, the, the podcaster who happened to be George Gammon said that the result would be that the whole global economy would collapse because the dollar is the global reserve currency uh, and federal debt uh, treasuries are the collateral for all sorts of trades globally. And we saw what happened with Silicon Valley Bank because they had too many of these treasuries that got uh, re suffered unrealized losses. I think there were like 30% loss. And over the whole banking system, 620 billion in unrealized losses from those low yielding bonds resulted from interest rate hikes. So if the bonds went to zero, the banks would collapse. Um, but so that sounds very ominous, but we've been here before and we can get out, we got out of it and we can get out of it again. So the first time was in 1789 when um, Alexander Hamilton, our first treasury secretary was, was faced with a, what was a huge debt at the time of $80 million. We had won the Revolutionary War against the world's um, most dominant power just by printing our own little paper paper money. But some of that money was actually issued as currency, but some of it was issued as promissory notes. And particularly the foreign debts would have to be repaid. If we didn't repay them, we, uh, we it would ruin our credit rating and no one would lend to us again. So it was imperative that these debts got handled somehow but our income was only 4.4 million. So what to do? Hamilton's solution was he turned the debt into an asset, which is actually quite clever. Uh, he solved the problem with debt for equity swaps uh, for stock in the first US bank. Uh, it was, so it was, they would partially accept these promissory notes and partially it was supposed to be in gold and they didn't actually get as much gold as they were supposed to, but it worked. And they took that capital and they leveraged it into credit as all banks do today, as Elfeca and Andy both pointed out. Um, and this allowed us to create our first US currency, which there's a picture of it there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, Hamilton said, it is a well-established fact that banks in good credit can circulate a far greater sum than the actual quantum of their capital in gold and silver. That's basically the, the fractional reserve system. Uh, but that was the Bank of England si system, which didn't have the best reputation. But the, the first U.S. bank had a different model. The idea was to use this credit not for speculative profits, but to, uh, for, to issue credit to government and private interests for internal improvements and other economic de development, as Hamilton wrote in his uh, system of public credit. So it was a national development bank and it, it, the charter expired after 20 years, but it, this charter was renewed in the second US bank, which was actually did a great deal of infrastructure and development, including building the Erie Canal, which was quite, quite something at the time. Uh, but Jackson, of course, shut the second US bank down. So President Lincoln came into office having to deal with a civil war and no way to fund it. And he would, would have had to borrow from the uh, British bankers or banks that were backed by British bankers uh, at something like 30% interest. So this would have left us 
hugely in debt as war typically does. Uh, so we'd be like third world countries are today that aren't able to repay their debts. So again, his solution was to return to what was called the American system of government issued money and credit. Uh, first, he issued paper greenbacks or US, uh, US notes uh, to the a lot of them to the extent of doubling the money supply. And uh, his government founded the national national bank system under which um, the idea was to turn the state charter banks into federally chartered banks. But to become a national bank, you had to um, use banknotes uh, from the, so banknotes of government debt like treasuries as uh, part of your capitalization. So this that was one source of income for the government and the greenbacks were another. And between those two, the, uh, the North managed to win the Civil War and we funded a great deal of economic development including the Transcontinental Railroad, which tied both ends of the, of the country together and turned a profit for the country. So good deal all around. So the money supply was doubled, but even, um, um, but anyway, it was doubled, but it didn't create inflation. As you can see from this chart, we didn't really have an inflation problem until around the Vietnam War or around the 1960s anyway. Uh, and why not? Because supply and demand went up together. And then we faced another serious crisis in the Great, uh, the Great Depression. <laughs> In 1906, there was a major banking crisis, which led to passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, modeled on the Bank of England. It, it was supposed to bank stop the banks and prevent bank failures, but it obviously didn't work because uh, we went through the greatest uh, national bank, uh, series of national bank runs ever. Uh, by 1933, 10, nearly 10,000 US banks had failed. So uh, Roosevelt, when Roosevelt came into office, he, he was again faced with this serious debt problem and uh, no way to fund it. Um, but what he did was he went back to the American system and leveraged bank credit for manufacturing and development through an entity called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was not really a bank, but it served, acted as a bank. It was basically the biggest financial institution in the world by the time it was done. Uh, the model was it started with a modest $500 million in capitalization, and then it issued bonds, which were primarily bought by the Treasury, and then the Treasury resold them to private interests or other governments or whatever. And um, over the course of the next uh, uh, 25 years, $40 billion were lent, starting with that modest $500 million in capitalization, funded the New Deal in World War II, rebuilt the country, did all sorts of amazing things like the Hoover, Hoover Dam, the things that the things we rely on today, these major infrastructure achievements at a time when the government was broke, the banks weren't lending. I mean, how did we do it? We could do that again. So um, it funded not only the New Deal, but our participation in World War II. And as um, there were things we didn't have like rubber, and we, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation funded um, research and development. So we developed a synthetic rubber and managed to come up with equipment for World War II that Hitler just didn't think we, we had that sort of thing, which we didn't have that sort of thing, but we met, we met the crisis and we managed to produce what we needed. And over the, that 25 year period, it, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation actually turned a profit for the government. Again, um, the country went uh, into debt, but it was not, it did not create inflation as you can see from this chart again. Um, it, it created $40 billion in new productive loans without consumer price inflation. And the reason was that supply went up with, uh, along with demand. And we can see that effect also in China, which in the last um, four decades has gone from one of the poorest countries in the world to an economic powerhouse. How did they do it? The government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three massive development banks. So what they do is issue the credit, 
build the thing and then the proceeds from the thing that they built to repay the loan that this picture down below is is a railway station i mean we have no railroad state ra railway stations that look like that ellen i'm going to jump in there real quick i'm really sorry to do this to you because this is my favorite part of your presentation but i'm under strict orders to get our next speaker on at exactly 20 till the hour. And so that's right now. Okay, I'll just there. So they uh, grew the money supply by 18% and yet prices remain stable as you can see, and we can do the same, that's it. All right, <laughs> thank you so much, Ellen. Okay, um, I wanna go right to our next speaker. He's been one of our biggest champions in the Southwest and has done a fantastic job in terms of getting their congressional representatives on board as co-sponsors for the National Infrastructure Bank legislation. So welcome to Senator William Tallman from New Mexico. So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to, uh, <clears throat> glad to be back on for the first time in several months. Uh, I've been asked this evening to do two things. One, to tell, them about, <clears throat> tell you about some of my ac activities over the last couple of years that, and secondly, uh, why the uh, $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill that was signed in late 2021 is so inadequate, at least as far as uh, uh, New Mexico is concerned, and, and I'm sure for the rest of the country. <clears throat> First of all, some of my activities over the last couple of years, uh, then I sponsored a, a resolution in the New Mexico uh, Senate earlier this year and um, to urge Congress to uh, enact uh, the National Infrastructure Bank um, op-eds. We've been uh, very active with op-eds in the state. We've uh, got the, the largest uh, newspaper in the state has uh, published uh, three op-eds. One uh, was uh, by me, myself. Uh, a second one was uh, signed by Dennis Montoya as well as myself. And then we had a third one that was signed by myself and 20 other legislators, as well as some leaders of various New Mexico organizations. I can't remember in the 15 years I've lived here, I can't remember an op-ed that was signed by that many people, 20. Um, they told me initially that they only, ex four is the limit. So we felt good about that. Uh, I have uh, participated in uh, approximately 20, uh, Zoom meetings, um, similar to the uh, Zoom meetings that were being held this evening. Um, now, with respect to getting uh, Congress persons signed on to the infrastructure bill, um, I have participated as follows. Uh, the uh, uh, Stu Rosenblatt, uh, tells everybody that I was the leader in the effort to get Representative Stansbury signed on to this bill. She's a, 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 state, a U.S. Congresswoman that represents uh, the central Albuquerque and the central portion of the state. And also I participated in a successful effort to persuade uh, Representative Fernandez to sign on to the bill. She represents uh, more than one third of the state. Um, also, I participated in an effort to get one meeting with the U.S. Senator Lujan, uh, two meetings, one with his staff and a second meeting with uh, the Senator himself. Now, moving on to uh, presentations, I made a presentation in uh, Santa Fe at the National Conference of the Council of State Governments in December of 2021. And, uh, and earlier that year in September, I participated in a presentation in, at a uh, NCSL a regional meeting in Colorado Springs. And um, a third meeting at a re another regional meeting with NCSL. And finally, uh, for the last two years, um, I've uh, served on a panel at the uh, National Conference of the Hispanic Farmers and Ranchers Association, which is held every year uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so that's uh, what I've been doing the last uh, couple of years. As far as the 
$1.1 trillion bill that was uh, signed by uh, Biden in uh, November of 21. It, on, it allocates uh, $3.7 billion for uh, New Mexico, which, uh, and, and interesting enough, of, of that $3.7 billion for New Mexico, 73% or $2.7 billion is for roads and bridges. You can make a good argument that that's not our highest need, but uh, as a uh, powerful uh, lobbyist who's listening in tonight told me, that's because the auto manufacturers and the highway contractors apparently are very powerful and influential. So that's taking 73 cents of every dollar. And also a year and a half ago, we had the state engineer quit because he said he didn't have the resources for water resources. He said he needed $2 billion for uh, water resources uh, to, to uh, increase, re replace aging pipelines and to handle the, to bring water into the our drought stricken area. He needed, he needed uh, 2 billion. The infrastructure bill only provided 350 million, which is one sixth of what we need. Um, broadband, we need $2 billion for broadband. And we're only getting one, 100 million, which is 1 20th of what we need. Uh, last week, there was a big article in the local newspaper saying uh, we're getting uh, $43 million for broadband from the federal government, that this was over and above the uh, over and above the, uh, the 100 million that we're getting from the infrastructure bill. Well, obviously, $43 million is just a drop in the bucket of what we need to provide broadband for the 25% of people in New Mexico that don't have either access or can't afford broadband. Electric grid, we're getting no money for electric grid. We're the second sunniest state. We're the fifth sun windiest. We have the potential to produce a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, renewables and, and we're lacking in the grid to transport all that energy. And finally, high-speed rail. We're getting uh, no money for high-speed rail. Well, I've, as I'm sure some of you have seen maps of proposed routes, and one of them would be through New Mexico. Uh, Interstate 40 it would follow Interstate 40. Interstate 40 is the busiest highway east of the Mississippi. Um, and it would obviously probably be the first line would be built uh, from uh, St. Louis, Memphis, uh, through New Mexico to Southern California. We're getting zero money for that. And um, as we all know, China and Europe are far ahead of us in um, high speed rail. So that's all I have this evening. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the near future. Good evening. I'm sorry I have to run. I got a, a town hall meeting starting in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Tom. And as usual, we really appreciate all everything that you do to help support the coalition and this movement. <clears throat> Next, I would like to go to the Midwest. Uh, we are so fortunate to have some folks from Ohio here tonight, and I'd like to call on Representative Sean Brennan. He is in the Ohio House of Representatives, and I understand he has been doing some uh, exciting work there. Representative Brennan? Are you on? I can, there we go. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you very much. I'm. I'm sorry, it's a little dark in here, uh, out here in Ohio right now. I'm actually outside in a parking lot. I just left our uh, a meeting here in my district. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, be uh, here for, uh, for most of your meeting. But um, recently, just to give you an update, uh, hello from Ohio, by the way, um, that myself and my, uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Michelle Grimm from the Toledo area, uh, introduced uh, a resolution in the Ohio House of Representatives uh, encouraging Congress to uh, introduce the uh, $5 trillion National Infrastructure Bank uh, bill. Um, I've been doing a voluminous amount of reading, thanks to Stuart, uh, and all of the uh, information he's been sending me. Um, I was a, a, a public school teacher for about 30 years uh, before going down to the state house uh, in January. I also served on our local city council for about 20 years. So 
um, a couple of things there. First of all, as a uh, as a history teacher, um, you know, I know a little bit about the history of Alexander Hamilton and and how he sort of invented the idea that we want to uh, bring back uh, uh, to our country today. Um, I'm also a little bit familiar with how we funded the uh, the Civil War, um, and uh, of course um, uh, a decent amount about the uh, um, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, that FBR, uh, FDR um, uh, really championed uh, during the Great Depression uh, and uh, during World War II, and um, you know, I'm just trying to uh, uh, use my skills as an educator to educate my colleagues on both sides of the aisle at the State House on how uh, how important the need is, uh, and how uh, it's not going to lead to an increase uh, in our national debt. Uh, how it's going to uh, mitigate um, the um, uh, how should I put this? The uh, recession that the Fed seems hell bent uh, on creating for our country, um, and just so many other benefits uh, that I think probably everybody in the Zoom already knows because I know I'm preaching to the choir uh, on this stuff. But it's uh, it's an honor to champion this in the state of Ohio, uh, and uh, I'm uh, I'm hopeful uh, that we're going to uh, gain support for it and and not only educate our folks in the state house but also educate our congressional delegation here in the state of Ohio uh, as well, because as we all know, that's that's really, uh, those are really the folks that we need to get on board with this thing because they've got the power to make it happen. Um, so um, yeah, so, and, and I should also mention again, uh, being a guy uh, from local government, um, I know uh, the great need of infrastructure in our cities here in Ohio from our sewer lines to our uh, water lines uh, to our streets and our bridges uh, and so forth, uh, and just how challenging it is uh, to um, to find the funds uh, for those projects. And again, I'm I'm sorry about the lighting, uh, but again, I'm in a parking lot tonight, so I'm I'm not the best looking guy, but that makes me look even worse. So I apologize about that. <laughs> Th thank you so much. We really appreciate your being here. That brings us to the end of our speakers. So I am going to open up the floor for Q&A. So if you have a question, please put your hand up. And I do wanna start out and um, I want to go back to uh, Professor Winnick and put him on the spot here a little bit. And having spent my career in the private sector, Andy, when you say price controls, I kind of shudder. And yep. um, so I do wanna um, say, um, could there be um, a strategy to incent additional supply so that instead of uh, focusing on controlling the price, we focus more on enhancing production and increasing production? And then the other point I want to make is that we don't envision injecting $5 trillion into the economy in one year. This National right. Infrastructure Bank is envisioned as a long-term solution to a long-term problem. So uh, could you address those comments, please? Yeah, sure. On the on the long term thing, that's a given. I mean, no no one thinks it's going to be done quickly, and in fact, that would be totally disruptive economically. So, to, doing this as a long term project, and that would mitigate, you know, some of the potential negatives of it in terms of the inflationary part, is a is a given. So that 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 goes without saying, and I I just didn't mention it. In term in terms of the corporate structure, I'm afraid I I don't quite agree. I mean, I think you you you. you with, I mean, the, the problem you have is that, I mean, let, let's just take as an example, the oil industry over, over just the la last period. There was not a one penny increase in the cost of oil to the American corporations that were producing oil. Their profits went through the ceiling. They, there was some increase in the global price, but it wasn't coming here. We could, we could have, our corporations could have maintained it. We had no economic necessity for the price of gasoline to drop, you know, jump two, three dollars a gallon. That was a decision made by corporations in the interest of, of maximizing profits. In that situation, what would what would have, you know, when you could could the American government have made a decision to basically operate on behalf of the American people, not the American corporations, and work out some sort of arrangement where we did not have to go through two and three dollar a gallon increase in prices when there was no increase in the cost to the American oil industry. That, if, that if, is there, a... there, 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 those are serious questions. Now, I understand their world prices, but but you know that transfer. Wasn't, 
didn't we have talk about a windfall profits tax though? Aren't there other ways of addressing that? I mean, I yes, agree yes. that's an excellent example that you just brought up about the oil companies. Yeah, 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 you can do that. You can, instead of price controls, you can put on excess profits taxes. That, that is definitely a, a possible, a viable alternative. I'm not saying there, there aren't other methods that can't be used to incentivize corporations to act, act in a more price-wise responsible way, but we can't ignore that it's, it's, it's a danger, it's a problem. And, you know, anytime, you know, there's a lot of money going out you know, from government or anyone else, you're going to have you know, some nefarious parts of the economy who are going to take advantage of it. And what I'm saying is we want to protect ourselves you know, and, and, the, and the bank. And if, you know, from that, we're going to have to be aware that that's a possibility and, and deal with it. The other thing is, is, is the planning mechanisms. We're, we're talking about a, a very, very complex process of uh, you know, building you know, lots of different sorts of projects in different parts of the state all of the, of, the, of the United States all at the same time. That's great. I think it's a, it's a marvelous thing. We should definitely try to do it, but we should be aware that that's that we I'm, that I'm not at all sure that we can simply trust that the private sector is capable all by itself of doing the sort of planning that will get what that will avoid bottlenecks that will get the proper supplies at the proper times of what we in the proper quantities that we'll need without causing major disruptions. And so that some sort of process, process of government oversight over the planning process and the scheduling process for these pro projects is important. I mean, a little bit, this is like you know, the other speaker said, we can simply say, okay, here's the money, you do it, good luck. You know, I don't think that's gonna work very well. <laughs> those, are, those are really good points. Alfaka, would you care to address um, some of Andy's points on strategic planning within a national infrastructure bank? Right, I'd love to. And we've had several speakers on some of our previous Zooms who have talked a lot about this. I see sort of three areas that we really need to pay attention to. One is our workforce. We currently have a, it's not like the depression days where we had 25% unemployment and all we had to do was go out and put up a four, you know, four hiring sign uh, for these workers, but we're gonna have to do a lot of work to train our workers, attract them away from low service pay jobs and provide them with everything that they need, housing, transit and childcare things so that they can come to work in these great paying construction jobs that we have in mind for them to, to take over. Uh, a second area where the bank will have a very active profile uh, it the, the legislation has what I call a bottleneck clause in it, um, and that's because we foresaw that there would be um, uh, supply disruptions for things that would be in very high demand to do all of this construction, like steel, like cement, uh, other construction inputs, even the electronics. Apparently, you need lots of computer chips just to put in a traffic signal uh, in your corner, in your local uh, road uh, intersection down the road. So all of these things uh, will uh, will need to be made in America, and that will pr uh, put a certain pressure on reassuring American manufacturing, <clears throat> but we have to make sure that it actually happens. And one way that bank can help with that is if we get reports back that there are supply shortages of certain goods, we can lean, we can immediately lean in and lend to start to lend to the private sector to start these new companies. That was very much the model that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did in World War II when we had almost zero capacity for building planes and tanks and things like that. Uh, and yet the government or rubber or you know supply goods that were needed. So what the government did was they bought factories or used space. They set up whole manufacturing cities uh, that were turn turnstile with uh, you know schools and housing for workers to work. Uh, to start plants, uh, for example, the chips uh, factory that's being uh, built in Ohio uh, doesn't have enough workers to build the plant nor to uh, man the plant and doesn't have the infrastructure that's needed uh, to sustain the area around the plant. So all of those kind of things do need that kind of planning. And one of the uh, very intriguing proposals that Professor Hockett uh, has come up with, who's been on our previous calls, is to have a kind of um, 
a mobilization board that is cons that consists of uh, heads of secretariats uh, in the government and private industry, where we can sit down and hash out all of these bottlenecks and get them ironed out to work, as Julie suggests, on the supply side. And then maybe we might need to talk about you know prices and make sure that we're not getting gouged with prices. But what, what we really want to do is in the long run, have a long-term platform for reshoring American manufacturing, building out our real sector, building our infrastructure to support all of those new businesses that are going to be popping up. So that's that's sort of the game plan. Okay. Thanks, Sounds Alfredo. great to me. I'm, I'm going to, um, I want to uh, throw a question out to uh, Don Cohen. And we've had some comments in the chat and um, people are uh, interested in the whole Chicago parking meter fiasco. And um, can you talk about, uh, was there an increase in fees yes. that went along with that? And then also I'm wondering, do you know anything about uh, uh, privatization of water resources? And is that something that the public should be concerned about going into the future? Yeah, on the first question, yes, they went way up. I often forget to tell that part of the story. So the, the parking meter rates went way up. I can't remember what it, the numbers, but yes, went up high. And I, I should also note, I, and I'll get this, they've pretty close to made all their money back. Already. Already, right? I mean, we could find you the, you know, the specifics, but I think it was about 15, 18 years. It was a terror, you know, we got taken, Chicago. In terms of water, absolutely. There's a couple of ways that comes up. One is, you know, there's water and waste water, drinking water and wastewater systems. Um, and there are uh, large global private companies that are attempting to take over these systems, to operate and maintain them, in some cases buy them outright. Um, that's happening all over the place. Uh, and some of them are French companies. There is a company based in Pennsylvania, Aqua, well, uh, that is really focused on trying to take over water and wastewater systems all over all over Pennsylvania. The other piece that people often ask about is, you know, is the bottled water. Um, and there are, you know, bottled water comes out of springs. I mean, in some cases, they come out of springs and are given really good deals. Uh, you know, I don't remember again this was in in uh, Michigan and. In California, they're basically we are allowing them to take our water, bottle them up, put them in plastic, and sell them to us. So you know, there's a there's a lot. Water's a big deal. You're on mute, Julie. Thanks. Thank thank you, Don. Appreciate those answers. Okay, I see in the chat that Rochelle has two questions, but she has not written them down. Rochelle, do you have some questions for us? Okay, my first question uh, is regarding, and this is the privatization question, but also in terms of price controls, which I actually do think is a good thing. But nonetheless, um, it seems to me two things about the bank could deal with that. One is the fact that it hasn't been discussed, but I know in the legislation that the board of the bank involves things like engineers, uh, leading trade union, representatives and so forth, as opposed to politicians or members of Congress. So it seems to me that in terms of the contracts that go out, um, that would be one way to protect against price gouging. But the other question I had about that is, even though it, I mean, it is a national bank and while it's, I mean, it's a national bank and therefore couldn't also a president do what presidents like Kennedy did when he forced, you know, the steel industry to back down on price increases and so forth. Let me just leave it at that question. Alfeca, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, so yeah, obviously we can. We we're, we can. We're going to have negotiations with big uh, um, with big companies on you know providing these goods. Uh, but we also need to work on making sure that we have a database of who can provide what goods made in America. Um, there's a couple of computer analysts from Florida have already started such a database for the bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, labeling everything is made in America. It's, it's still very thin and sketchy, uh, but we, we want to target and keep in mind when we run across these plants. One plant, for example, that I thought uh, when you look at the steel plants across the United States, we import a lot of steel, uh, especially from China, 
uh, that it's uh, we're not competitive with Chinese prices. Why? Because they are government owned uh, industries and they subsidize them heavily. Uh, and so we can't compete uh, with that. Uh, but we're going to when we give an NIB loan, we're going to give it for the full price of the cost of steel. And then we'll keep our eye on the cost for all those products. But all of these as we move through the process of building out infrastructure, buying rail for you know new new transit lines, uh, everything will be able to come down in price the same way that computers came down, the same way that the price of automobiles came down. Uh, it'll 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 happen and we have to keep our eye on the ball for companies that are really in the know. One one plant that I think is really ingenious in um, in uh, Colorado, is uh, a steel plant that makes the rail for uh, for um, train you know train rail uh, in a long long rolled steel process and then puts it on a long uh, train track to move it uh, out of that area uh, and and to where it'll be um, you know in installed in the ground but it makes it out of recycled steel from. Uh, from automobiles and other large appliances, and it use, uses electrification based on renewable energy to remelt that steel. So those are the kinds of great ideas that we we can replicate all across the country. And there's there's plants all across America that are that are already starting to do that, and we just need to keep track of them so that we can build out these American uh, facilities. Can, Thanks, can, I, can I answer? Can I weigh in on that question? Sure. Just yeah, really go ahead. Briefly. Go for it, John. I think the, the most important thing for any, listen, you know, these are complicated things, right? If you're going to have all this kind of, all this money to spend on infrastructure, it's complicated. And you could appoint the best possible folks, but people will make mistakes. Um, critically important is having the right, the two things, the standards, real clear standards of quality and quantity and job, you know, and the type of jobs and whether they're living wage and whether they're environmentally sustainable, really standards that, you know, uh, that articulate what our public purposes are. That's number one. And then having the tools and the staffing to make sure that those contracts that, you know, that the contractors live up to those standards. Those two things are, whether it's public, whether it's private in any configuration, you need those two things. I also wanted to say that this proposed legislation has been introduced into the last two sessions of Congress. And over the course of that, we've had multiple, multiple conversations with uh, legislators, members of Congress, their staff, and that sort of thing. So we have been taking input on uh, how to write the Buy America provisions and, and uh, how to ensure that adequate training and apprenticeship programs will be done. So. Uh, we've received a lot of feedback over the last several years, and we have endeavored to to incorporate that feedback into the into the legislation to make sure that it's really addressing those concerns. So thank you for bringing up those questions, Rochelle. Uh, now I want to kind of change uh, the, the uh, subject a little bit. We have a, a really uh, kind of interesting question here in the chat from Tim, who uh, I can't really find it right now, but he asked me something to the effect of, when will the NIB people be appearing on TV talk shows? And uh, let me just say, Tim, that if you have any contacts, we would we would love it. We're, we are happy to appear on any television talk shows uh, that we're invited to. And so we're working very hard to get the word out. Uh, we also had another comment from another uh, person in the chat who uh, was wondering again about our, our exposure, uh, I believe, and, and what we can do to um, really raise the level of awareness around the country of the National Infrastructure Bank. And I wanted to let you know that, that we're working very hard, thanks to the efforts of uh, people like uh, Sean Brennan in Ohio, who has introduced that resolution into the Ohio House of Representatives. Um, we've uh, recently had the legislation passed uh, in Washington through the House and the Senate. So we are working very actively around the country um, to uh, introduce resolutions in support of, of this uh, legislation. Joe, Joe, do you have a comment or a question for us? So I put, a, I put a, uh, a comment in the chat. I read it recently. I think, I can't remember, I think it was from Hockett Namorogba in a paper. And they said that the RFC was the largest corporation in the world at its time. Yep. And its uh, balance sheet matched or exceeded that of all of Wall Street. Uh, so it was just a remarkable uh, 
statistic and it shows you the potential of your vision. Great. Hey, thanks, Joe. Uh, Ellen, is that is that true? Yes, it was definitely the large, and I think that's probably why it got shut down because it was way too competitive for Wall Street to deal with. So it was shut down ostensibly because it was an emergency measure and they didn't need it anymore, but it was obviously a very good development. It should have been continued. Thank you. Um, now, another uh, comment question from the chat. This is from James uh, Hanley, I do believe. Um, and he is wanting to know either from our NIB people or from Don Siefke, is the pipeline or proposed pipeline to Lake Powell the biggest project that has been identified by the ASTE? Don, can you answer that question? You're, you're muted. Um, could you, I'm not quite sure of the question. It's, uh, it's more than a pipeline. Really, it would duplicate the Colorado River aqueduct from Lake Havasu over to Los Angeles and San Diego. People that turn their water tap on in Los Angeles and San Diego, I am sure that 99% of them do not realize that the water comes out of that tap because of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that financed the, not only Hoover Dam, they also financed the Parker Dam. And as far as I know, the original uh, agreement was that 50% of the electrical power to move the pumps on the Colorado River aqueduct would come from Hoover, 50% from Parker. That's how they paid for those two dams. And the construction part of the Colorado River aqueduct was an immense undertaking in the 1930s. It has siphon aqueducts. It goes up to 1,800 feet. It crosses the Mojave Desert for heaven's sakes. So building a aqueduct system or water conveyance system as Alfeca likes to use from Simsport, Louisiana to either the San Juan River or directly to Lake Powell across Texas and New Mexico, most of it is flat. And the hard part is going up the continental divide to the dam itself, which is at 3,500 feet. But I've worked out the numbers on that. To lift that water, it would take 64 billion kilowatt hours of electricity. That is about the same amount of electricity we are expending now to run Bitcoin, which is a worthless product in my opinion. But of that 64 billion kilowatt hours, you're gonna get back 85 to 90% of it when the water comes back down through the electric generators on those Colorado River dams. And the advancement in technology on wind generation and solar generation and the advance in storage batteries, we're now up to these mega pack batteries are, that are lithium iron, not lithium phosphate, not lithium cobalt, but lithium iron. These are massively efficient, very long lasting. They can go through thousands of charge and discharge cycles. You can have these things out along Texas and New Mexico, where there's heavy sunlight, heavy wind, and you can pump 24 seven if you wanted to. I checked this morning, uh, we have 2 million gallons per second this morning of water going down the Atchafalaya. I've, I've learned I've mispronounced that word. It's really pronounced the Atchafalaya River. If we pump 50 to 100,000 gallons a second of that, this whole problem on the Colorado River goes away and we, de and we defend all that food production in California and Arizona, and we defend the water uh, supply for Southern California and for Central Arizona, which in my opinion is still extremely important. We Thank figure you, the cost of that is somewhere between 15 and $23 billion to do it. And I have got really good cost information on that. Uh, it's just a question of, well, I don't know how to do it exactly, but the water, oh, by the way, I did, this is new information. Uh, I talked to the Assistant Attorney General of the state of Louisiana, the Atchafalaya River water, he claims is owned by the state of Louisiana. He said he would have no objection to taking a small amount of water from that river because the problem in Louisiana is too much water, not a shortage of water. So that's all Thank I can you. say on that subject. Thanks, Don. We appreciate it. For people who want to know more about it, uh, Don, I believe, had an op-ed in, was it USA Today? 
that talked well, no, about the USA Today, I had a, some op-eds in the Desert Sun newspaper, and Elfeka and I got a really nice op-ed published in January in the Albuquerque Journal. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about this potential aqueduct uh, project, uh, you can Google Don and or Alfeca. And now I do see that we are joined by Ruth Frulin from Seattle. Ruth, can you give us a quick rundown on uh, public banking in Washington State and what you all have been up to? Uh, well, I think that we're still getting our feet on the ground as far as our new Washingtons for uh, public banking. Uh, nonprofit organization is concerned. And um, what happened is uh, this last uh, two year cycle of trying to uh, put forth a public banking bill um, kind of fizzled out. We we have one person who's a Republican and, and actually I take that back, he's a Democrat. Uh, we need We need more Democrats that are not sort of Republicans at heart. Uh, and he's in a position of really being able to control it. This year, it didn't uh, even make it out of the committee. So we're having to kind of regroup. And um, and that's, uh, I, I think that we have we did a good job, uh, thanks to you all, in getting that resolution, the memorial passed. And I think that the more we can work together for both the state banks and the uh, national bank, I'm taking notes because, you know, it's like arguments for one to me, it's like arguments for another, for the other. And um, disability is so important uh, that I don't even take a loss as a problem. So, and and we did just, um, there was a public banking conference down in at uh, Willamette University in Oregon that uh, should be uh, put online pretty soon. It was back in March. And that really brought together a lot of people with a, a, a lot of good ideas and it covered everything from what is money and money generation, new monetary theory and those sorts of things, which, uh, and um, especially how each state is approaching this problem. Uh, and um, so I think that's all valuable too. Thank you, Ruth, we appreciate it. Okay, Andy, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you have a question or a comment? Just a question, a quick or a quick comment. Um, San Francisco was informed just recently that the FDIC would refuse to to back to insure a public bank. They 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 are among the furthest along in trying to develop a public bank. They've spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on business plans and what have you, and all of a sudden they got slapped down by by the uh, FDIC. And I guess I'm curious whether Ellen or Alpac or anybody else has any idea or any plans. I don't know that, you know, we're not really going to be a deposit bank in the uh, National Infrastructure Bank, but even so, whether I am wondering why that happened. You know, is, that, is, what, is there something in the charter of the FDIC that would have to be changed to allow them to do it? Or is this a political move that they're, you know, Powell and what have you are just too conservative and don't want to do it. I, I have no idea. So it really is a question, but it, it is a problem I'd like to know if anyone knows anything about. Looks like Ellen knows the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I just wrote an article about that actually, which, which isn't posted yet. But my understanding, what I heard was in connection with the um, public banking's uh, American Samoa, American Samoa public, uh, they only have one bank, so they were turning it into it's not a state, but you know, provincially owned bank, and th uh, they've been told that um, FDIC insurance was set up as to insure private deposits, and therefore they will they will give them FDIC insurance if they privatize, and they're talking about actually selling off to a private or turning into a private bank. So that's too bad. But I don't know that it's written anywhere. And um, certainly there are crypto people that are objecting because they their banks have been rejected, which are very, like there was one bank called Custodia Bank, which would have been 100% um, collateralized. In other words, they weren't going to lend the deposits. They were going to keep the deposits. <laughs> like they were going to do what people think they do with the deposits, which is like keep them in a box and that's your money and you can come and get it when you want. So there was no risk to the FDIC at all. The FDIC turned refused to give them insurance, and the Fed said, "Well, we can't 
give you a master account unless you have insurance. So therefore they can't be in the network. Well, the goal is obviously to keep crypto out of the money system in general, but that, that won't actually work because they're, they're all going abroad. The um, crypto exchanges are going abroad and we'll just lose that business, but people can still, you know, buy their crypto or whatever. So it's a it's a political issue. There are lawsuits about it right now, and I guess we just have to wait or join in the lawsuits, depending. Okay. How about Timothy? You look like you are unmuted, and uh, you've got your hand up. You have a question or a comment? Oh, how to get the GOP on board? Emphasize the fact that the NIB's activities would cause production to keep pace with demand, thus preventing inflation. In other words, we would have supply side economics with the great Ronald. Reagan talked about, thus Ronald Reagan would have approved the NIB. Are you making those points to the GOP? I am glad you brought that up because we are talking to members of the, the GOP Republicans on pretty much a daily basis. And so I'll, t I'll tell you, I know, for example, we have a call set up for tomorrow with a couple of Republican legislators from Alaska. And so we have been doing this around the country, really, really working hard to build support. What we want to do when the bill is reintroduced in the next Congress is make it bipartisan with uh, Republican support. Um, and, you, you know, I, I want to take the opportunity here to show a couple slides. Um, we were just able to get a resolution in support of uh, the National Infrastructure Bank through the Washington legislature, the House and the Senate there. And um, there you see the memorial that was just passed in Washington. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in Washington, thanks to people like Ruth Ruland, who is on uh, the call today, as well as many, many other folks in Washington. And we were also um, so happy to see that the New York Progressive Action Network, which is comprised of thousands and thousands of activists and progressives in New York, uh, recently passed a resolution, I think maybe in just in the last week, uh, passed a resolution urging Congress, as you can see there, to enact national infrastructure bank legislation. So we've been uh, working around the country. Uh, I mean, you've heard representatives here today from multiple states, and I want to ensure you that we are working hard to get Republicans on board. And so if you know any in your area, uh, give them a call. We would love to set up a meeting with those folks and brief them on how a national infrastructure bank could help their area. All right. Um, so do we have any other uh, questions at this time? Um, I think we have some final slides to show and I wanted to give everybody here the information on how to contact the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. We, um, as I mentioned earlier, are working very hard to raise awareness around the country. We would love to do presentations for your local legislators, your, um, your members of Congress, your state uh, senators, or uh, members of uh, the House of Representatives in your state. So uh, please give us a call or send us an email. Uh, the legislation that we had in the last Congress, you saw the, the number there, HR 3339. It's going to be a different number when it's introduced in this Congress, but uh, just be on the lookout for that. So there you see our website. Uh, if you go to our website, we do have a lot of handy information there, including a downloadable brochure that's very useful if you wanted to be able to download that and give it to your city council person or the mayor of your city or your state legislator, uh, we would love it. We appreciate uh, all of your help. We also have a donate button. Um, we This is a fully volunteer operation and we depend on donations from our supporters to, um, to do these webinars and to keep the website up and, and that sort of thing. So if you are so inclined, please feel free to click on that donate button. And um, Thanks again for all of your uh, attendance and your interest in this subject. And please help us get a National Infrastructure Bank created and the legislation through Congress.